Well, I'm glad you could be with us today and being able to worship God, and what a great thing it is to be able to do that. Uh, there's been a lot of things going on, as you are aware. It may seem like nothing is going on, but there are still some things that are happening. Um, Dave is going to be starting a new class next week. I just wanted to mention that. It's in room 104, and so he's going to be talking about some uh, basic things and some things that we need to learn. And so if you're interested in that class, please go there. Getting ready is one of those things that Jesus seems to do, and he knows how to do that, and we see his plan as it develops and as it unfolds. He waits until the time of their confession, Peter's confession specifically. He's given them all this input and information, and they've watched him teach, and they've seen him do miracles, and they've seen all kinds of things happen. And yet he didn't ask until much later, who do you think I am? And as soon as he asked that, Peter's able to say, I believe you're the Christ. You're the Christ of God. That's who I really think you are. And what an amazing thing that is for them to realize because he waited for them to come to the conclusion. He didn't just say, by the way, I'm the Christ of God, believe it. He lets them come to that conclusion on their own so that it is part of their faith. They needed to know that part first. And as they need to learn that part first, he then drops the other shoe. And so then we get to this part. It says, and he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. That's where we wanted to begin today as we begin to look at our, our Bibles and look at what he's saying. He tells them about suffering. He tells them about his rejection. He tells them this is what's going to happen. Well, there may be a reason why he didn't lead with that in the very beginning and say, follow me, by the way, I'm going to be killed and uh, there's going to be a lot of suffering. And no, he waits until they know who he is because that's most important. And once you know who he is, then what he's about to do and the way he's about to go about it becomes very, very important. But does that sound like a good plan? Really? I mean, you're going to be killed and then be raised on the third day? That seems like a pretty difficult plan. But up until that time, it had about been about Jesus and about him being a new king in his kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is coming. And so they're ready for him to take over. They're ready for him to be in charge. They're, they're ready for this new kingdom to be there. And Jesus doesn't seem to explain the plan. I hope there's a lot more words that go along with this. But it seems to not be a real explanation of the plan. It just seems to be very abrupt. I'm going to die. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to raise on the third day, but I'm going to die. A lot of times we want to know why. Why is all this going to happen? What's happening with this? And Jesus seems to just announce those things. But he's getting them ready for what comes next. Because what comes next is going to be the most difficult. We think Jesus is big. We think he's miraculous. We think Jesus is able to heal. He's able to do all of these great things. He's going to heal everybody that ever gets sick. We won't need health insurance anymore. All we have to do is go to Jesus and he will always heal us and there will always be food because after all, he feeds people and he does all these great things. And so we can understand how Jesus could take care of all of us. We want a king like that, right? One who can take care of all of us. But that isn't what Jesus came to do. He came to be the king who can take care of all of us, but in a very different way. And that different way is what he's trying to explain now. It is personal. 
It is about your life. It is because he loves us. It is because he wants what's best for us. It is because he cares about us. And actually, we deserve to die for our sin. But we find that Jesus says, I'll take your place. I'll be the one who gets there first. And I will do that because of love, because of this sacrifice, because it, it demands a response when somebody loves us like that, doesn't it? That somebody would love us that much that, that we're going to say, okay, this, I, I can't just ignore that. It demands a response, and so we would follow him. Well, this isn't the only time. There are several times where he seems to say this as we look through the Gospels and look through this. The next time is one of the Pharisees and tax collectors, and he talks about, you remember when he says, the Pharisee and tax collector are both praying, and one says, I'm thankful I'm not like all those other people out there who are sinners. But the tax collector just says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The rich young ruler comes to follow Jesus, but he doesn't. He can't leave his money behind. Even though he had kept all of the law, he can't quite make the jump to be following Jesus because Jesus says, go and sell everything. I don't need you to fund everything. I need you to sell it so that you can follow me. And it gets to be one of those real difficult times. And as he's faced both of those, the hypocrisy of the Pharisee and the rich young ruler's refusal to give up what's most important to him, Jesus says this. And taking the 12, he said to them, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon and after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day he will rise. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what he said. Even though he says it, even though he tells them, they're not really able to understand it. But it's in the face of all of those other things that you see him saying, this is how it's going to happen. This is how it's going to take place. Everything that was written in prophecy is going to be done. Delivered over to the Gentiles, meaning the Romans. He will be mocked, treated bad, spit upon, flogged, and then killed as if that wasn't bad enough. That's got to be really difficult. And on the third day, he would rise again. And he tells them it'll happen. But you know how it is when somebody tells you something that you weren't expecting, you just, it's like you can't hear it. It just doesn't make any sense to you. It just, it just seems like it's wrong, and so you don't go with that. And this may have been specifically hidden from them, but it was said, and it was there, and they're still not getting it. This isn't the first time. And they're still not getting it. Jesus is preparing for our salvation. This preparation had started a long ways back. Clear back in Abraham when the promise is given to Abraham. And then it comes through John the Baptist. And you see him specifically preparing the way for the Messiah, for Jesus. And he does that by calling the people back to God, by saying, your hearts need to be ready. That's what really needs to happen, and that you need to be able to accept God. And so we see this God, the, we see God's plan unfolding, and we're able to see how all of this works. And when within a chapter, we're at the triumphal entry, and it's the last week of Jesus' life. It all leads up to this. Jesus is ready for a cross. Well, that's a lot to get ready for. Actually, Jesus is ready for resurrection. And the cross is just that step in the way. 
But in order to get to resurrection, you have to get through that cross to be able to get to resurrection. How, are we ready for what comes next? Do we feel like we are? It feels like we've been in isolation so long that, you know, we're almost afraid to come out like bears who have been hibernating or something. You know, can we come out? Is there any people out there? Are we going to be able to interact with anybody? Or do we still have to just do the fist bump? What, how do we do this? And so it might take us a little while to get used to that, but get ready. Things are going to happen. Things are coming. We recognize that there are times in our life when we're just not ready yet, and we may tell our kids that. If your kids ever ask you about driving, they're ready to drive. They think they should have keys to the car. They're ready to go. At 12 or whenever, they decide, I know more than you do, Dad. Just right at that teenage years. Do you remember those years? I remember mine. I did. No more. But my kids, oh, they weren't ready at all. It's funny how that happens. Well, they're just not ready for that because they haven't grown up enough. They're not able to make decisions. They don't know enough. They're not as good about judging situations. And so we make them wait a little while until they're at least able to see over the steering wheel. And uh, then we say, okay, now you might be ready because it takes somebody who's responsible. We say that about school and about being able to finish school. I mean, they've had six years already by the time they're 12. Six years should be enough, right? Well, it's not enough to learn everything. And so you might need some more schooling, and it'd be better if they'd stay in. Are we ready at 12 to say you need to have a job? We're going to put you into a full-time job. Would you trust this guy to be your banker? I mean, maybe you need to grow up a little bit more. And there's some more getting ready that needed to be done before you got into this position. And, you know, it might be a little worrisome if he's the guy who's preparing the loan on your house. And you're saying, I think we need some more. Or maybe they're too young to get married, right? Yeah, that's the bride and groom. Uh, it's, it was a fun wedding, all right. You know, you can get married at 12. No, you can't. At least I hope not. I mean, we're not ready. There's not enough maturity to handle it. We're certainly too young to be parents, right? And as you start looking at that, it's important that we get ready for life. It's important that we get ready for Jesus as well and for what he wants. And so what are we getting ready for? Well, we're getting ready for heaven, right? Isn't that what we want first, most, best? We're all going to heaven. Actually, that's the easy one. We can take care of that pretty well, pretty easily to get ready for heaven. Uh, the thing standing in our way is our sin. And so it's easy enough to say, I'll just, you know, get rid of my sin. And how do I do that? Well, I repent of my sin and I say, I'm sorry and I mean it and I turn my life around. I'm not ever going to go that direction again. And then I believe in Jesus. I am baptized into Christ. I make a covenant with him. And so then I am ready. I am ready to go to heaven. I'm ready to do what it takes. And so we're baptized into Christ and yeah, that's, that's pretty easy, simple. If you need to do that today, we can take care of that today. But heaven's just the overview. He says, I want you to be righteous. I want you to find the righteousness of Jesus. I want you to put that on. Are we ready for heaven? I saw this that I thought was interesting. If worship bores you, you're not ready for heaven. 
because you really don't understand. And you might need a little more time on earth before you're ready for heaven. Because if this doesn't make sense, it's not going to make any better sense when you get there. Is that what we need? Maybe church is just here to, I got myself here and I got myself into a pew and that, that's good enough, right? That's all God expects. I'd say we're not ready. And we need to be ready for what comes next. There's a maturity that comes in worship that we need to develop. Do we get ready for church? Well, what does that mean? Well, I've got ready. I got myself dressed and I got here. And I sat in that pew we were talking about. And so, well, the early church started on Pentecost, and there was a lot of preparation before that. And Peter begins to preach, and are we ready for worship? Are we ready to sing? Are we ready with that gospel? Are we ready with the relationships? Are we ready to be able to learn about God? Are we ready to make him a part in our life, ready to be mature about our worship to God. But when you go to church, then you realize that there's just more people there. Are they in the way? Or are they people to love? It's really about learning how to get along with people and learning how to love on people. And I think that's one of the most important things is learning how to love. We need people we can love. Maybe we fall in love when you're ready, not when you're lonely, just because it's your own need. It was because of Jesus. And we can see the good in everybody, and we can love them, and we can see, allow them to see God in us, and we can be blessed by God, and we can be a blessing to them. Yeah, this part is harder than just getting to heaven. Because some of them are ornery and a little bit difficult to love. But we're ready to love them, not expect them to love us. And we join with them together when we're working together, when we're serving together, when we're doing things as a body of Christ, as people who fit all together into what Jesus is trying to do here. And so we're ready for good works. And we're prepared to live this Christian life, right? It would be so much easier if we just went straight to heaven, don't you think? Because by the time we get it all figured out, how to be loving and caring to all the other people around and how to be able to teach them and share with them and how to raise children in the Lord and get them to be good Christians and then how to spread this gospel message to people that we know that are friends, it's, it's almost easier. Can't we just go straight to heaven? The answer is no. It's not that easy to get out of this life. Uh, it takes a lot more. And so one of the things that needs to happen is this growing, this learning how to do it, this learning to have some maturity, this living out the Holy Spirit daily in our life, this maturity that comes because we know how to have the right attitude and the right character as we run into people who agree with us or disagree with us, but that we would have the character of Jesus, that we would know how to forgive and how to live with people when they've had to forgive us. Boy, that's hard. We just avoid them, right? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Doesn't the Bible say, avoid those who get in your way? I don't think that one's in there. And so maybe we need to learn how to be good Christians and get ready for tomorrow, for living out a Christian life so that we can understand what grace is about so that we can understand what suffering is about, because you can't understand grace until you understand suffering, until you understand love that would pay for somebody else. And then perhaps we'll get grace, and we live out the grace of God. And you know, you know we always do better when we're prepared. 
when we've thought about it, when we've realized what we're going to have to have, what kind of training we're going to have to have to be ready just for this. One last passage I want to share with you comes out of Matthew 25. Yeah, I know, we're using Matthew. It's not found in Luke, so we need to go to Matthew. But it's one of those parables that I think is very important that talks about getting ready. Jesus says, For then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps, and they went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took the flask of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out and meet him. And all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. And the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast. But the door was shut. And afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Strange parable. It is a really strange parable. The kingdom of heaven will be like, is the way he introduces this parable. And so this is what the kingdom is like, not the judgment, okay? So the kingdom of heaven is like this. There's ten virgins, they all, ten unmarried people, they all have gone to the wedding and five brought extra oil for their lamps and five did not bring extra oil for their lamps because after all, they've got enough. Uh, why should we have to carry extra oil? Where do you put oil anyway? Can you put oil in a pocket? Then we have to carry an oil can. We don't want to have to do that. We're just, yeah, I know, never mind. Some things happen. He's delayed. You ever know a wedding to be delayed? Sometimes they are. You need a bride. You need a bridegroom. Anything else is negotiable. But if you don't have those two, then it's, yeah, you need to delay. When they get there, they trim their wicks. It's finally time, and they realize, I'm not going to have enough oil. They try to borrow some oil. It's five on five, split right down the middle. I don't know if the foolish thought they could take them. They apparently have money. That's the suggestion. Why don't you go buy some? I don't think we're going to have enough. Aren't those girls mean? I mean, that's just the way. Why wouldn't they share? Isn't that what we're supposed to do as Christians is to share with each other, right? We should all be willing to share every single time. Wait, no. It doesn't fit the parable exactly. Well, but our lesson's not on sharing anyway, so we can just go on with the parable. Are they being mean? No, they're just being realistic in that you're going to make both of us run out of oil. And so you can say that those five wise virgins are being mean to, for not sharing. Or you can say the five foolish ones are being cruel for demanding the oil that will cause all of them to not get in. Which way do you want to blame? I mean, you can, we can go either way, correct? So go buy some. And when they go to buy oil, then they can't get in anymore. All right, strange parable. We usually take this to be about heaven. But there are some difficulties in taking this to be about heaven. 
uh, because it's be ready or you won't get in, and it preaches really well. Uh, you can scare people to death with this one. You don't have enough oil. You know you don't have enough oil. You need to get ready. Boy, that would be great, wouldn't it? I just can't do it. Because I'm not really sure this is about heaven and who gets in and who doesn't. And yes, we be, need to be ready for heaven, but it just doesn't fit that well. It seems to be more about Israel and about getting ready for Jesus. Because this is just going into the marriage, right? They have been waiting on Jesus for so long. There's a Messiah that's coming. There's a Messiah who's going to be here. He's going to be the one who delivers us. He's going to be the new one in his kingdom. And everyone is ready for him to come, but they were not ready for Jesus and who Jesus was. And so five of them are ready for the Messiah who comes, for Jesus, who's great. They can understand what God's doing. They can see prophecy fulfilled in him. Mainly, they can see that Jesus has compassion and care for them. And there are five who say, this is not the way it's supposed to go. We don't get it. We don't understand. We don't think this ought to be part of it. And it's about being ready for Jesus. Some are just not prepared themselves. They wanted a Messiah, all right, but I just don't want him. But it's not really a question of refusing them. It's just a question of they didn't get ready for the Messiah that came. They never saw Jesus. And that's why when Jesus says to the foolish ones, I don't know you. Because he didn't know them. Because they had never prepared to meet Jesus. And so it may come out at the same point, actually. We realize that as they're waiting, all ten had fallen asleep. But five of them are ready. And the Messiah that comes, it is about being ready for Jesus and ready for his salvation. God is about to take you to the next level of life and of love. And we need to be ready. And some are ready for salvation, for the gospel. And some reject Jesus' way of saving them. I wanted a Savior who's going to come and, and deliver me and do everything for me and, and pay for everything and heal everything. And he would never let me suffer. He, all, he wants me to be happy. You ever heard that? People who believe in a Jesus who just wants them to be happy and is willing to do everything? No, you just don't even understand who Jesus is when he came and said, I am going to a cross, and I expect you to go there too. You see, we accept Jesus and his way of saving, that there is a cross, and there is redemption, and there is baptism and there is a covenant and a church and a kingdom and being part of a body and you cannot just say I want to skip from here to heaven and I want to skip all these other people I don't want to have to have a relationship with anybody I just want to be in heaven right can't I do that and Jesus came saying I'm building a kingdom you will be part of it or you do not have place with me Ouch. But that's what he says. We don't get to miss this part of it. We belong with this part of it. And getting ready for Jesus means getting ready for the things Jesus brought, for the church Jesus established, for the way in which Jesus has us interact with people, for growing to heaven, for loving people for being able to have this maturity in a relationship, 
for being able to love other children of God who are his children. And so we work together and we worship together. It isn't as if we could give away some of the other things anyway. We can't give away any of our reserved Holy Spirit. It isn't about being cruel. I just, I I wouldn't know how to do that. I can't do that. We can't give away our forgiveness where we've been able to forgive and other people can't find a way to forgive and we can't give them that ability to forgive. They just haven't figured out because they thought they were going straight to heaven and they didn't need to be around anybody who even would need any forgiving. And we can't give them any of our grace is because they didn't figure out how to find grace yet and we can't give them our worship because worship comes from within us it's not as if anybody is refusing them and saying there's something I could give you but I won't even though the parable kind of plays out that way it's we realize in Christian life that's not how it plays out and it just doesn't work that way And we need to be prepared for dealing with sin and with grace and with joy and with love and with the Holy Spirit and with forgiveness. And how do we do that tomorrow and the next day and next Sunday? We get people ready for Jesus. We invite them to come And that's what this church is about. We get people ready for Jesus. And he is about to take you to the next level. It all begins with accepting Jesus, believing in him, repenting, being baptized into Christ, making that covenant. Our sins are taken away. We can be sure of heaven. We can be sure it's there. And that's the easy part. And then we deal with forgiving sins. Ours can be dealt with on that day. God can forgive, and yet we're going to have a harder time working through it to where we really believe that he did and that we can forgive the next person and that we can accept their forgiveness of us without feeling like we're on probation. And we can understand what it means to be part of a body of Christ with people who love each other and who care about each other. And it's just such an amazing thing. Are you ready for Jesus? I think we need to be getting ready for him. It's what happens when we come here. This is the training. This is the place. And Jesus comes here to worship with us and to be part with us. Today, if we're able to help you in any of these things to draw closer to Jesus, that's why we're here. Would you come while we stand and sing?